Good afternoon, everybody. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our College of Liberal Arts short program commemorating and marking Earth Day 2022. And I want to give a special uh, shout out to our friends across the lawn here. Uh, we clashed on the university calendar, but I'm delighted that Action Earth is here and the uh, UNH Gardening, Organic Gardening Club. So I appreciate that you're taking a little break from the music just while we have our short program. So this is our second annual Earth Day commemoration or affirmation. And it's partly a way on, we have such a beautiful campus here at UNH, as you all know, it's, a, it's an excuse for us to get out, but it's also a, a way to showcase all the terrific work being done in the College of Liberal Arts, in the curriculum by researchers and artists, and all the ways in which we variously engage with issues got to do with the preservation of the earth and with some of the challenges and threats to our ecological health. So uh, I'm delighted that people are willing to participate. And last year, for the first year, we had three, again, three people. It's a short program. Uh, we had a sociologist, Larry Hamilton, talking about his many years of research looking at attitudes towards climate change. We had Jacques Lee Wood, one of our master cellists here at UNH, perform a beautiful piece composed by Professor Laurie Dobbins in the music department called 11th Hour, which in the music liner notes talked about the 11th hour in terms of the urgency of climate change and ecological devastation. And we also heard from Professor Jed Coffin from the English department who shared one of his uh, creative pieces of fiction where he talks very evocatively uh, about the impact of climate change. So it was a wonderful event. It was a very wet, cold, windy and snowy half hour, even though it had been a very nice week, but that half hour was actually uh, pretty horrific. Today, I'm delighted to say we've another three presenters and I'm excited for all three. And again, showcasing the, the variation in disciplines and how different disciplines approach the issues that we confront as we think about specifically today, Earth Day. We'll begin with Professor Kirk Dorsey, Chair in History, who will talk about very uh, shortly, and he can say whatever he wants to say, but uh, <laughs> about himself. I'm not going to elaborate on who he is. I think a lot of people know him. Uh, but he's going to talk about a very interesting case study about the efforts to locate a, an oil refinery, as some of you might be aware of this, in Durham some years ago and how that turned out. So thank you in advance, Kirk. And then we're going to hear and see from Kira Wright, one of our staff in the art and art history program who does terrific artistry. And she has a very interesting project that she's been working on in the plastics lab here at UNH. So we'll hear and as I see more of that. And then we're going to be called back to our true heritage by a wonderful student, a sophomore, Sadie Marston, a sophomore who's majoring in classics and anthropology. And she's going to ask us, what should we sacrifice to Demeter? So thank you all three in advance. And please say whatever you want to say to contextualize your project. We're so excited. So thank you very much. We can clap in honor of our speakers. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. If I knew I could say anything for seven minutes, I might have thought of a different uh... I'm going to start with a sentence, first sentence of a book. It was no coincidence that the age of ecology was also an age of environmental inequality. First sentence from the book by Andrew Hurley, Environmental Inequalities, Class, Race, and Industrial Pollution in Gary, Indiana. Now, my title said I was going to talk about Durham, and you might be wondering, Gary is not that close to Durham. But I think that sentence about inequality and the age of ecology is worth keeping in mind when we think about what happened in Durham. So it's a well-known story here in Durham of 50 years ago, 1973, the Olympic Oil Company proposed to build an oil refinery on Durham Point Road. The Olympic Oil Company was owned by Aristotle Onassis, one of the richest, and I think I can add safely, sleaziest men on the planet at that point. Oh, come on, it's true, we know it. <laughs> If he wants to sue me, he can. Um, and the Olympic oil refinery is not only going to be built on Durham Point Road, but it was going to take the Isles of Shoals and use that as a tanker port. And then there was going to be a pipeline to pump oil from the Isles of Shoals through the town of Rye and over to Durham, where it would be refined. Now, Aristotle Onassis was powerful, but he also had powerful allies. The governor of the state of New Hampshire, Mel, New Hampshire, Mel Thompson, thought this was a great idea. 
the publisher of the Manchester Union Leader, the most powerful newspaper in the state, back when we used to have powerful newspapers, thought it was a great idea. A lot of people in the seacoast in 1973 and into 74, as the fight went on, thought it was a great idea to build the, America's biggest oil refinery in Durham. And they thought that in part because, of course, we were facing an oil crisis because of American foreign policy. There was an oil embargo on the United States. So the idea of having an oil refinery right here with good jobs was very appealing. A lot of people have written about this. One of our PhD students, Kim Jarvis, in her recent book on environmental history in the state of New Hampshire has a chapter about the Durham oil refinery that she did research right here in the library. Lisa Mall, who's one of our master's students, master's of arts and liberal studies, wrote a book on Rye's story fighting off the uh, oil refinery proposal because Rye had a fight as well. Uh, one of our uh, students in the um, a TRIO program is doing her project on the people in Newmarket and Durham who supported the refinery because there were so many people and people have not talked about the supporters. David Moore, who used to run the uh, survey center, has a book on this. So it's been a well-covered subject. The focus of the research that most people have done has been how did the people locally fight off Aristotle and Onassis? And there's been a lot of focus on people like Nancy Sandberg and Dudley Dudley, a local editor, a local legislator who did a fantastic job organizing the people, fighting off this uh, proposal and ultimately defeating the proposal for an oil refinery. It's a victory for home rule. It's often held up as a great example of NIMBY, not in my backyard, organizing to fight off something you don't want. And in that sense, it was a huge victory. But there's a question that I don't think is anybody asked, anybody's asked yet. Where did that refinery capacity go if it wasn't built in Durham? Because somebody got it. 1973, the story shouldn't just be what happened in Durham, it should be a two-part story. Because in 1973, there was another proposal in the United States for an oil refinery, and that was in a town called Garyville, Louisiana. Not related to Gary, Indiana, but Gary, just by coincidence. Garyville, Louisiana is a town, unincorporated town. It's about half black, half white. It has a much higher poverty rate than Stratford County and a much lower education rate than Stratford County. And in 1973, Another really big oil refiner is proposed for Garyville, and it opened in 1976, and it's still there. So same year, two proposals, very similar. One got fought off, one got built. The Durham oil refinery fight is often talked about as a David versus Goliath fight. Aristotle Onassis makes a pretty good to Goliath. Actually, so did the mayor, so did the governor. What if instead of killing Goliath, you scared Goliath off and he went and beat up somebody else? It's not the same story anymore. So I think the question we need to ask when we, invite, when we organize environmentally, which we should, it's Earth Day, I'm even wearing green. This was the closest thing to an environmental hat I had, the Baltimore Orioles. <laughs> I can't wear my national park hat in public, it's too disgusting. But the question we should ask is, who's gonna get stuck with the pollution that we don't want. The lesson out of Gary, Indiana, is that when they fought off air pollution, they joined together, fought off air pollution, it became solid waste it, from the scrubbers and the smokestacks. Guess who got the solid waste buried in their neighborhoods? It wasn't the middle-class environmentalist out in the suburbs. I think this is relevant. We've got a problem or an issue going on right here in town, very close by over at Pease. Are we gonna build an air cargo facility at Pease? I don't know if it's a good idea to, buy an air, to build an air cargo facility at Pease, but I'm pretty confident if it's not built there, it's gonna get built somewhere else. Are people gonna stop getting Amazon Prime and overnight delivery? Probably not. So if we fight it off, that might be good, but we at least need to ask who's getting the air cargo facility. I'll stop there and turn it over to Kara. Thanks so much, Kirk. Uh, you should have uh, asked me for an uh, environmental hat. I have so many. <laughs> That's OK. Um, hi, guys. My name is Kira Wright. Uh, thank you all for inviting me here today. I'm staff in the Department of Art and Art History. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about the process of creating a uh, recycling lab for uh, reusable materials in art and design in the Department of Art and Art History. So I'm a sculptor. 
and it's bothered me for a while now that um, there was an inherent quality of waste in my own sculptural practice. Um, I make work about the environment and about the human environment relationship. And I would end these shows with like tractor trailers full of stuff that I either had to sell, figure out what to do with, or store. And at one point I thought, enough is enough. I can't keep on making this work if I am um, making it in a way that's unsustainable. It goes against the concept of the work. And that was when I first started exploring the potential for recycling, not only as a medium of art, but as an art practice inherently. Um, and with a little bit of research, I realized that it's actually fairly easy with the right tools and the proper safety measures in place to recycle small scale. And recycling small scale is actually more productive than relying on big scale industrial recycling. Only 9% of plastics ever created will get recycled once in their lifetime. Other than that, the other 91% most likely dumped or incinerated. If we recycle small scale, we're able to take full advantage of this plastic waste. Um, and there's a reason everything is creative out of plastic. It's an incredibly versatile medium when you break it down into its smallest parts. It's consistent, it's predictable, it's reliable, it takes color extremely well. It's, it's a miracle um, product and we have so much of it at our disposal that we aren't using. Um, so all these ideas have been percolating in my head for a while and then um, one day we get an email from Ben saying that there was a donor who had reached out to the department looking to support a project in arts and sustainability and I think it was like within five seconds flat <laughs> that I emailed him back with this um, kind of the skeleton idea for a workspace at UNH that would allow UNH community members and students to experiment with sustainable craft and sustainable art, namely in uh, plastics. So the Plastics Design Lab will initially consist of three machines, um, one which will be purchased, two which will be built in-house. Our first machine is going to be a shredder, and this is inherently important to the recycling process. This breaks down our plastic, our milk jugs, our bottle caps. If it's got a coat on it, you can break it down essentially. Um, and we'll break it down into a reusable particulate called granulate or flake in the industry. And once we have it down to this size, it's extremely easy to get it back to a uh, melting temperature and then use it to cast it into basically anything you can imagine, including 3D printer filament to be used on one of our many 3D printers here at UNH. So the shredder will break it down into its base material again. But then we need to have a couple machines to um, essentially uh, broaden our horizons to what we can make with this flake. Um, if you want to make something a little bit larger or even create sheets of it to fabricate um, furniture or housing elements out of, um, we will be having a compression mold. This is made out of a heated chamber with a lifting table in it that will press two parts of a mold together to create um, a um, resulting object or shape little bit of detail for you guys who don't do sculpture, basic idea of a mold. Um, and this will be really great for making larger scale objects. Um, if you want to make something that's maybe a little bit more detailed or even make something um, repeatable or a run of production, say something like hardware or a prototype for an industrial design, we will have an injection mold as well. And this is a kind of ingenious, extremely simple machine, um, simple enough for me to actually build it myself. It consists of a heated cylinder that you then put your flake into um, and at the bottom of that cylinder you um, will screw on your mold. Um, this can be a mold that you've either cast out of aluminum or machined on a CNC machine which we have access to here thankfully. Um, and you'll be able to then use a lever to pressurize that uh, uh, plastic material into the mold creating extreme detail under pressure um, so you can create, um, uh, for example, um, we could cast some of the figures that our uh, sculpture students model in plastic. You could create um, reusable hardware parts for different design elements in plastic. Um, it, it, with these three simple machines, including the ability to create sheets for making uh, 
sculpture out of and I have a few very basic sheets over here that I made in a toaster oven. <laughs> um, so think about what I could do with uh, not a toaster oven. <laughs> um, it's it broadens our horizons incredibly. And um, but these machines, while they're important to our ability to make things and, you know, intrinsic to our ability to make things, I don't think that's the most important part of the plastics design lab. I think it's our duty as artists, as makers, as craftspeople to understand our materials so intensely that we can bring out those hidden qualities in them that make them important and that make them beautiful. And I think the most important part of the Plastics Design Lab will be a place where people can experience that hands-on for themselves. And through creating pieces with value out of them, we inherently bring value to plastic, something that's culturally seen as disposable and as one use. And once we start bringing value to a waste product, we stop treating it like waste. Thank you. Uh, ah, okay. Um, hi, my name is uh, Sadie Marston. I am a sophomore here at UNH. I, uh, my pronouns are she or hers, and today I'm here to sort of switch gears a little bit. We've been talking a lot about the uh, what's going on right now and what we can do to help. I'm here to sort of talk about uh, the ideals that we should have in our hearts and what we should do uh, how we should feel about uh, how we should tackle these problems with love in our hearts, basically. Um, so, of fair-haired Demeter, Demeter, holy goddess, I begin to sing. Homeric hymn to Demeter, line one. Thus starts, in my opinion, one of the most important pieces of work, work the world has to offer. In this heartbreaking tale, the author describes the Greek god Demeter, and uh, who is the goddess of the grain and the harvest, and her fair daughter Persephone, and her eventual kidnapping and bringing her to the underworld. Uh, it is a lament to the unfairness of the world, a threnody to grief, and it is an ideological myth about the seasons wrapped up in a neat little bow. But I believe that it tells us everything that we need to know about Demeter, for one, but also what we need to do, what we need to keep in our minds as we go about this Earth Day and all Earth Days. Um, so in order to actually get uh, through the speech, I'm going to have to talk a little bit about the abduction of Persephone, that myth. Um, so trigger warning, uh, kidnapping. Um, I just... Uh, I'm going to outline it here for you um, in case you don't know it, but if you don't know it, I urge you to go read it. It is uh, very, very good. I can point you to some resources. Um, anyway, Persephone was the daughter of Zeus and Demeter, uh, and she was out picking flowers in a meadow all alone. She was this really uh, like fair goddess. She was beautiful, like young maiden. and. Rising up from the meadow, there was no one around except for her, and rising up from the meadow like an elevator was this black chariot made of like obsidian and stone with uh, like skeletal horses with coals for eyes. It was very, very scary. And uh, basically, this was Hades, and he came and he snatched her up and he dragged her down through miles of earth into what we know as the underworld. Um, basically, uh, no one had seen this except for two other gods, uh, Helios, the god of the sun, and Hecate, god of witchcraft, because they knew all. And they basically uh, told Demeter what had happened, and Demeter was furious. Uh, she started to lobby other gods against each other. Um, they, she started to try to eventually, like, take revenge on Hades by, like, getting gaining support, but she couldn't find support anywhere. All the other gods basically told her, you know, these things happen. Um, 
which, I mean, to be fair, they did happen in Greek myth all the time, but uh, that doesn't solve a mother's grief. And so she went into despair. She did the only thing that she could do, and she went into sorrow. She took her uh, life, the, her gift to the earth, the act of growth and uh, the, the cycle of life, basically, and she took it away from all of humanity. And some things started to happen. Um, nothing happened for a little bit. And then as plants started to die, nothing would grow. And as animals would start to die, nothing would be born. And it ended up being that people started dying because nothing could be born or grow. And the cycle of life essentially stopped. Now, Zeus couldn't let this happen. He still wanted sacrifices from the humans, of course, and he didn't want anything to happen to that. So he decided to make Hades give Persephone back, but made an agreement with him that because she had ate food from the underworld, she had to go back every now and then, which ended up being her seasons. Now, that's the end of the story. But... I would like to focus a little bit more on the uh, grief that Demeter uh, endures in her in this tale. She is a grieving mother. She is uh, she basically she basically does the one thing that everyone does when they are sad in our day and age and she almost isolates herself. But what she does next is very powerful. Uh, as Homer writes, But grief more dread and bitter fell upon her, but she kept apart from the gathering of gods, and, disfiguring her form, went among the cities and rich fields of men for many days. She surrounds herself with mirth and laughter by essentially going to a bar, which is a very powerful metaphor. She brought down the mood a little bit because she was sad in a party, basically. But she eased her pain. This is a story of descent, both into sadness for Demeter, but also into humanity. She essentially uh, tells us what we should do when we're sad, when we're experiencing grief. She tells us to find others who have experienced grief like, like ours, and connect with each other, um, which uh, she experiences essentially what it means to be human in this uh, story, which is like she wanted the world to stop and it just kept turning. Of course she was a god so she was able to stop it herself, but we can't do that. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about why, uh, or what we should do in relate uh, about this myth in relation to Earth Day. Um, essentially, I'm here to convince you that we should be con forming connections with each other. We should be forming connections with the Earth in hopes that, like, we don't isolate ourselves. We don't isolate individual problems. We form a network that we can each lean on in order to not descend so far into despair that we can't see the, the end of the day. Despair is important, but if, we, if that's all we have, then we can't see the light and we can't help heal what has been broken. And we can't help heal the earth until we see the light, basically. Thank you. Thank you. thank you, Sadie. That was beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, and thank you, Kira. Wonderful, and thank you, Kirk. So, I appreciate all of you with your different disciplines and perspectives. What you have shared from very different perspectives, certainly all of them deeply empowering. Uh, the power of political action, but also when something apparently gets resolved, it still has consequences. 
not in my backyard, but certainly in someone else's backyard and typically in the backyards of those who are less well off than we, who we are. Uh, Kira's work is amazing and it's just amazing to hear you talk about the process and all of that garbage that results from your wonderful sculptures so, and then how you do that. Uh, so I find that just also your agency in being able to see the potential of what to do with plastics and as you say to add value to them as also create beautiful art. Uh, and then Sadie, this is just beautiful, uh, such a poignant myth and you present it so well and yet also pointing out how it empowers us, right? Even at those on the darkest of days, we, we read report after report about climate change. It seems like it's a juggernaut that we can't do anything about. And I think the message that you're helping to convey is that there is always light. There is always room for action, making choices, but they have to be individual choices, but they also have to be collective communal choices. And in these choices, always to be remembering our, our true humanity. Uh, and that the earth is very much a part of what it means to be human because we have such positive relations with nature and how, what we experience in terms of creativity, in terms of intellectual thinking and in terms of just the emotional connection as we feel here on our, on our beautiful campus which uh, is we can on some of our dark days we can go for a nice walk and really appreciate the beauty. So thank you very much, all three of you. It's wonderful. Thank you all for coming out today, this afternoon. I wave to our friends. Now they can resume their music, uh, Action Earth and, and the organic growers. But it's beautiful. Thank you. We have a recording of this that we'll share widely. And if you'd like to also share it when it becomes available. So thank you all. It's a beautiful afternoon. It's going to be a beautiful weekend. So please enjoy it. Thank you again. Thank you.